Welcome back everybody. Today we're going to talk about reaction rates in equilibrium and this is an area where you would definitely need to practice this material so please make sure that you plan on doing so in either Moodle or in your textbook or both. I recommend both. So in order to react molecules and atoms have to touch each other. They have to hit each other hard enough in order to make the bonds break. Anything that reacts, that increases how often and how hard the molecules and atoms hit each other will make this reaction happen faster. The activation energy is the minimum energy needed to make the reaction happen. It has to be supplied to get the reaction to start happening, and if the activation energy needed is low, then lots of the collisions are already hard enough and reactions happen fast. If the activation energy needed is high, then few of the collisions are hard enough and the reactions happen slowly. If the reaction is endothermic, then you have to keep supplying heat in order for the reaction to progress. If the reaction is exothermic, then it releases energy and some of that energy can be used to supply the activation energy to those reactions that follow. The overall energy change on this diagram is delta H. Some of the things that affect reaction rate are temperature, concentration, and particle size. For temperature, higher temperatures mean faster particles, which means more and harder collisions, so faster reactions happen. In concentration, when you have the more concentrated molecules, they're closer together and they collide more often, and so higher concentrations lead to faster reactions. With particle size, remember that molecules can only collide at the surface. So smaller particles have a bigger surface area to volume ratio and therefore have a faster reaction rate. The smallest possible particle is an ion or a small molecule. And dissolving also will speed up these reactions. Getting two solids to react with each other is the slowest of the ways that particle size can affect reaction time. Catalysts are substances that speed up a reaction without being used up. For example, enzymes are biological catalysts. They speed up reactions by giving reactions a new pathway, and the new pathway has a lower activation energy. So more molecules have this energy and the reaction can go faster. There are also inhibitors. Inhibitors block catalysts, so they will slow the reactions down or stop them. In reversible reactions, the reactants and pro products are never used up. In fact, they are both constantly reacting and being produced. A reversible reaction can take the following summarized form. A plus B yields C plus D, and C plus D yields A plus B. So this reversible reaction can be broken down into two, those two reactions. However, you would just write it with the double-headed arrow like you see on the diagram here. These two reactions are occurring simultaneously which means that the reactants are reacting to yield the products as the products are reacting to produce the reactants. Collisions of the reacting molecules cause chemical reactions in a closed system. After the products are formed, the bonds between these products are broken because the molecules collide with each other, producing sufficient energy needed to break the bonds of the products and reactant molecules. So you can see an example of the summarized form of a reversible reaction and the breakdown of the reversible reaction N2O4 yields 2NO2. Reaction 1 and reaction 2 happen at the same time because they are in a closed system, which is why you write the double arrow. When I first put reactants together, the forward reaction will start, and since there are no products, there is no reverse reaction. But as the forward reaction proceeds, the reactants are used up, so the forward reaction slows. The products will build up, and the reverse reaction will then speed up. Eventually, you reach a point where the reverse reaction is going just as fast as the forward reaction, and this is called dynamic equilibrium. The rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction once dynamic equilibrium has been reached. The concentration in products and reactants will stay the same, but the reactions are still running. Catalysts will speed up both the forward and reverse reactions, so they don't affect the equilibrium position, they just get you there faster. 
At equilibrium, the concentration of products and reactants is constant. We can write a constant that will tell us where the equilibrium position is. Square brackets in this equation means that we're talking about the concentration or molarity of each component. Remember, molarity is moles per liter. So KEQ in this is the equilibrium constant, and it is only affected by temperature. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve this. So we're going to calculate at 25 degrees Celsius, there's 0.15 moles of nitrogen, and 0.25 moles of ammonia, and 0.10 moles of hydrogen in a 2 liter container. So what we need to do is find the molarities first. So we get the concentration of ammonia, which is 0.25 moles per 2 liters, so that gives you 0.125 molar. Nitrogen is 0 0.075 molar, and hydrogen is 0 0.05 molar. So when we look at this reversible reaction, we take the concentrations of the products times the, with their coefficients as the um, superscript, and then the reactants divided by the coefficients to, superscript. So you can see here we did 0.125 molar, squared it, divided by 0 0.075 molar times 0 0.05 molar cubed. And so that gives us 1.46 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. What this tells us is that if the equation constant is greater than 1, the products are favored. If it's or the equilibrium constant, sorry. It, more products and reactants are at the equilibrium point. If the equi e equilibrium constant is less than one, the reactants are favored. So that means that in the combination of hydrogen and nitrogen gases to make ammonia, that there will be more reactants than products at the equilibrium point. Because 1.46 times 10 to the negative seventh is definitely less than 1. So if something has changed in a system at equilibrium, the system will respond to relieve the stress. There are three types of stresses that are typically applied. Changing the concentration, changing the temperature, or changing the pressure. Changing concentration is a way in which chemists control how much yield is generated from a chemical reaction. If you add reactants or increase their concentration, the forward reaction will speed up and more product will form, so therefore the equilibrium will shift to the right. If you add products or increase their concentration, the reverse reaction will speed up and more reactants will form, and the equilibrium will then shift to the left. If you remove reactants or decrease their concentration, the forward reaction will slow down and more reactants will form, so the equilibrium will shift to the left. And if you remove the products or decrease their concentration, the reverse reaction will slow down and more product will form, and the equilibrium then shifts to the right. Reactions either require or release heat. Endothermic reactions go faster at higher temperatures, and exothermic reactions go faster at lower temperatures. All reversible reactions will be exothermic one way and endothermic the other. As you raise the temperature, the reaction proceeds in the endothermic direction. As you lower the temperature, the reaction will proceed in the exothermic direction. As the pressure increases, the reaction will shift in the direction of the least concentrated gases. So low pressure will go to the side with the most gases. So three questions that you need to ask. First of all is how fast the reaction proceed does it, will it depend on the collisions and activation energy and this is affected by temperature, concentration, particle size, whether a catalyst is present. So how fast is also determined by the reaction mechanism or the steps that the reaction goes through to take place. So a reaction is likely to happen if the delta H is negative, in other words it's exothermic, or the delta S is positive, so that's entropy, so there's more disorder. 
How far the reaction will go is based on the equilibrium if its forward and reverse rates are equal. The concentration is constant if the equilibrium is constant, one for each temperature, and Le Chatelet's principle. Those are all involved. So we do have to go back to thermodynamics to find out whether a reaction will happen. Substances tend to react to achieve the lowest energy state, so most chemical reactions are exothermic. This doesn't work for things like ice melting because an ice cube must absorb heat to melt, but it melts anyway. So the question becomes, why? Well, entropy is the degree of randomness of order, of disorder. Better the number of ways that things can be arranged and designated as S in equations. The first law of thermodynamics states that the energy of the universe is constant. The second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the universe increases with any change in energy state. So for example, if you drop a box of marbles or watch your room for a week without cleaning it, the entropy is going to inc increase. So for example, a solid has an orderly arrangement. A liquid has molecules next to each other but isn't orderly, and a gas has molecules moving all over the place. So entropy increases when reactions of solids produce gases or liquids, or liquids produce gases. A sub entropy increases when a substance is divided into parts, so reactions with more products than reactants have an increase in entropy. So in other words, if it shifts to the left, it's got more entropy. And entropy increases when the temperature is raised, because the random motion of the molecules is also increased. Entropy, finally, will increase if a substance is dissolved, because again, you're di putting it into its component parts. So there are tables of standard entropy, and standard entropy is the entropy at 25 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature, and one atmosphere of pressure. And this is abbreviated as S prime, which is what that circle means, and is measured in joules per degree Kelvin. The change in entropy for the react for a reaction is delta S prime equals the the S of the products and the S of the reactants. So for this example, when we look at this one, our delta S is 213.6 plus 2 times 188.7 because those are our uh, rate products minus 186.2 plus 2 times 205.0. So our net delta S is negative 5 joules per degree Kelvin. Spontaneous reactions are reactions that will happen regardless of any external forces. Non-spontaneous reactions will not. Even if they do happen, we can't say how fast the reaction will happen, because two f factors influence that, enthalpy, or heat, and entropy, or disorder. Exothermic reactions tend to be spontaneous. They have a negative delta H, or negative enthalpy. Reactions where entropy of the products is greater than that of the reactants also tend to be spontaneous, so you have a positive delta S. So, a change with a positive delta S and a negative delta H, both of those things together, means that the reaction's always spontaneous. A change with a negative delta S and a positive delta H is never spontaneous. But for the others where you have a different combination of those things, you have to actually look at them individually. Remember that temperature affects entropy. The higher the temperature, the higher the entropy. For an exothermic reaction with a decrease in entropy, like rusting, it is spontaneous at low temperatures and non-spontaneous at high temperatures, because this reaction is enthalpy driven. An endothermic reaction with an increase in entropy is like melting ice. It's spontaneous at higher temperatures and non-spontaneous at lower temperatures. This reaction is entropy driven. The energy free to do work is the change in Gibbs free energy, so delta G. 
Remember, the T must be in Kelvin. All temperatures have to be in Kelvin. And all spontaneous reactions release free energy. So the delta G is going to be less than zero for a spontaneous reaction. So let's review. To find out if it's spontaneous, if you've got a negative Gibbs free energy, a negative enthalpy, and a positive entropy, all at any temperature, it's spontaneous. If you have a variable delta G, a positive enthalpy and a positive entropy, at high temperatures it will be spontaneous and it is entropy driven. If you have a negative enthalpy and a negative entropy, it will proceed at low temperatures because it is enthalpy driven. And if you have a positive Gibbs free energy and a positive uh, enthalpy and a negative entropy, it will not proceed at any temperature because the reverse is spontaneous. Okie dokie. That is going to conclude the reaction rates in equilibrium. This will not make a lot of sense to you until you've actually started doing the questions. So I would highly recommend that you start working on these questions and then come back and re-listen to this lecture because that's about the only way you're going to really get this stuff. So if you have any questions, of course, join me on office hours, and I'll be happy to help you then. Have a great day.